to, to speak, uh, first of all, I was dumbstruck that I was actually going to be allowed to speak for more, more than 10 to 15 minutes. Because whenever I'm on the campus, I always end up getting squeezed because I'm talking at the end of everybody else. And Bob said, you can actually talk over an hour. So I'm so excited. So now the historian background of me is going to come out a little bit because I'd like to talk a little bit about theater in general. But um, as an architect, I do corporate work. I do residential work. Um, but really, my passion and my specialty are building for the arts. And uh, when I say building for the arts, I say museums, performing arts centers, artist studios. And so you can imagine, especially with an economy that like we have right now, that um, it, it's a tougher time for the arts. And so I get this question often, is do we really need the arts? And do we especially need to go to, have, to, go to a different building? You know, I've got this fantastic stu uh, performance, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, theater space in my home. You know, I got surround spot sound, all the great operas are on DVDs. Why can't I just stay home and watch the opera? Muse the museum of my, my city has all their, their collection online. I can just sit there and look at a screen and scroll through it. Why do I have to go to an art museum? And, and so when I've asked that question, uh, it's, a, it's a fair question. I, right now, you might not want to be sitting by the person you're sitting with right now. When you go to a theater, you're at risk. You're getting out of your space. Now, I might, we're having problems. Maybe we have to move down here. But you know, other people are in your space. And, and, and that's part of the experience of the arts. And so I'm also part of that experience because I designed the building you're in. And that is part of the experience. It's not supposed to go away. So you go to a movie theater, and a movie theater <coughs> wants everything to go away. It blacks out. It does everything to make the space disappear. You go to a performance in the hall, you see the room. You experience the room, and you experience the people with you. And that is part of the richness of an artistic experience. You go to a museum, and no matter how great that screen, your computer screen is, you've got to see the paint strokes. You've got to see the three-dimensional work of art. And all of that is affected by the building it's in. So starting with um, stepping back, art, and, and I, I know I'm on the West Coast. I promise to change coast soon. Um, <laughs> Uh, starting with the cyclical quality of art, this came to mind because it's actually the first architectural thing I've ever, I ever did. I was studying in New York, and a lot of people don't know this, but we've got New York's Times Square. Times Square almost was raised in the 80s, 1990. 46 theaters in Times Square, only two or three of them were being used for live performances. Uh, most of the halls were built in 1900s, 19-teens, 1920s. The Great Depression hit. A bunch of, of houses went dark. A number of them became movie theaters. And Times Square, it was cyclical. It didn't bottom out, but, but it just wasn't what it was at the turn of the century. In the 70s and 80s, it was really bad. Most of the houses were dark. Um, and what wasn't dark <coughs> were often XXX theaters. And so a number, of, they wanted to raise all of Times Square and put skyscrapers, office skyscrapers, because you can imagine, Times Square is in the middle of Manhattan. Where do you get a state, you know, that kind of real estate in the middle of Manhattan? And so, not surprisingly, the people who own the theaters wanted this to happen because you're going to make a lot more money with a flat piece of land in New York than having to deal with a dilapidated theater. And so I was hired, there were a bunch of community leaders, preservationists, artists who got together. They started a bunch of lawsuits, and as we know now, they won. And it, the, they weren't raised. So my job was to go down, and we would be given theaters, so like the New Amsterdam, and I would write reports, like, you know, facade intact, or you know, the marquee's perfect, and of course I couldn't get inside without buying an XXX ticket, so, you know, <laughs> my parents were so thrilled that that was the job I had. I would go into these theaters, and, and I would do sketches, and I would talk about what was still in these halls, and what was amazing is uh, they were 
almost intact. Many of them were very, were really preserved. So, um, Disney is one of the, was one of the big catalysts. They bought New Amsterdam. Once they started investing in the early 90s, um, Times Square took off. And I, I remember, I was thinking about it because this year um, I saw one article that the last theater is now, is now finished with renovation, has performances. And Condé Nast did a study that said the number one tourist attraction in the world is Times Square. And so it's kind of amazing to me that it's less than two decades since this place was almost level. That's the cycle of the arts. And I work with cities across the country and I work with places around the world and the arts are the biggest draw. If they look at numbers of people who come into cities and urban centers for sports, it is not what it is for arts. And in fact, it's, it's, it's much less than for the arts. And so the arts are where we come together as a community. And on a campus like this, it's a place that the community can come to a campus. So I want to start with Times Square to talk about theaters. Urban theaters are very different animals than a performing arts center like this. When you go to London, Piccadilly Circus, New York, where I'm from, Minneapolis, traditional theaters were basically a facade. You had a public street and there was a back of house. And actually, in, in Times Square, my favorite spaces are actually the back alleys where all the crazy fire escapes are and the artists all hanging out smoking and, you know, the limos are next to the dumpsters. And, and you never see that because as the public, you see one face and you see this marquee. And so the whole building is often just a swath. It's just one facade that's often a lot of signage. And the building might even come back and then it'll grow. The theater will grow behind it. So you get stores and you get um, restaurants and shops. So going back to New Amsterdam, it's all about Mary. You know, it's Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins. What's the architecture? And that, that's what a downtown theater experience, an urban theater experience often is. I want to show you a plan. And I, just for the non-architects here, a plan for architecture is a cut. It's a horizontal cut through a building. So you're looking from above at a horizontal cut. Here's a plan. The blue is the public space. You can see it actually grows on the side. You know, there's probably stores and restaurants here. And the curve is showing the lobby space, and I did blow it up. Colin, you're gonna love these toilets. <laughs> <laughs> forget, forget about accessibility of these toilets. But um, you've got these huge giant stairs. Yeah, toilets crammed in like crazy. Look at the size of this lobby, this upper lobby. With this giant, the bar is huge. I don't know how you get to the bar to get a drink. But this is a typical urban theater. They're often, the lobbies are very tight. Grand Dame Carnegie Hall. It has a little bit bigger lobby, but it's not much space. It's a space that you go in and you do your ticketing. And you go into the hall. The lobby is not a, a space to, to really experience. And that's why marquees, especially like in London and New York, are really important. Because they're going to keep you from the rain. Mo um, Often, if you're in Times Square at an intermission, the streets are full because you can't be in the lobbies. They're, they're too small. And so, see, I can't get over to the West Coast yet. I'm sorry. We're going to go to Europe. The Paris Opera House is extremely important to this discussion, and not just with performing arts centers, but with arts buildings in general. Paris Opera House was during the Second Empire. Baron Hausmann is leveling Paris, creates the Paris we know and love, the grand axes, all the buildings work in the Second Empire style. And the French, who still love to do architectural competitions, which is pretty cool actually, did a competition for the Opera House. And a man by the name of Charles Garnier won. And why this is so important to this discussion is we have a building 
It doesn't have a front. It doesn't have a back. It actually has major axes on all sides. And this is the kind of thing that we do as when we design performing arts centers. Is he's got he's got a loading area. We've got all these spaces that don't want windows. A performing arts center. Look at this room. We've got room after room after room with no windows. A huge <coughs> scale. A huge scale. And you want to make this interesting. How do you do it? And Garnier actually, it was Second Empire, a uh, bit neoclassical, so he decorated the living daylights out of it. And he also created more program. And he expanded that around this building. So you can see his fly tower up there. It is decorated with everything, you know. And this thing's frou frou but that's Second Empire. He made this building interesting from all sides. But one of the most important things he did is in the programming. And when I say programming as an architect, an, architect, an architectural program is a list of the spaces that are in a building and the square footage attached to that. So when I'm talking about program, I'm talking about he added a lot of new space. This, remember I said the plan is a horizontal cut, a section is a vertical cut. So we just cut through the building, we pull the piece away, we're looking inside. And this is such a great section that it's going to give me a second to just tell you, when we're talking about theaters, especially an opera house, we talk about fly towers. When you go to Disney, you're in a concert hall. The stage is part of the room. When you have an opera, you have one of the most elaborate staging events ever. If anybody ever gets behind New York and Met uh, Metropolitan Opera, it's phenomenal. So, a fly tower is a very big, massive element. And what a fly tower does is, okay, there's a hole between, this is our hall, and this is the, the stage. The hole is proscenium. A lot of you probably know that. A proscenium opening is a certain height. So let's say we've got a 30-foot proscenium. The reason it's called a fly tower is we add elements fly. In other words, that curtain has to be at least 30 feet tall. So we now need at least 30 feet to pull it up. It's a scrim. It's a piece of set. So already you know your fly tower. It's a 30-foot proceeding. It's going to be 60 feet. Then you need structure. You need rigging. So in general, a fly tower is easily two and a half times the proscenium. And you can see they're very complex pieces. And these horizontal lines down here, those are the trap space. So in our stage, this is where the sets drop into the floor. So just to let you know, when, I, when you look at a theater, a section tells you so much more than a plan because there's so much going on in the vertical direction. So, oops, I was supposed to. See, I hate PowerPoint with these little doodles, so I forget to use them. So what was really amazing with Garnier's program is this. This is the lobby. So here is our hall. This is the rest of the building. And nobody thought of it that way. And so people talk about this building and they talk about performing arts centers now as having three theaters. You have the theater that is the performance. You have what they call the invisible theater, which is the back of house, which I mean, we've all seen enough movies and things to know. Though that's just that's an amazing place too. You know, it's it's actors, it's makeup artists, it's technicians. There's all that happening. But the third theater is the audience. And in Paris in the 19th century, and it start and it starts everywhere. Is you now have the rituals were controlled with the court and with the church. And in the 19th century in Paris, you have a middle class that's educated, it it's, has money, and it wants its own community. And, they, and that's where the arts come in. And in Paris at this time, opera was it. But this kind of idea now is it's the community room. These lobbies become the community room of museums and performing arts centers throughout the country and now working with them throughout the world. And we have Garnier to thank for that. And so, Here's a palatial stair. You wouldn't see a stair like this. It'd be in a palace. It's now in the people's opera house. And so you can imagine everybody wants to see you know, who's wearing what. It's, 
He had an ice cream parlor for women. He had everything in this. It's a place to be now, not just the hall. So I told you we'd finally get out here. <laughs> so um, looking at this aerial, this is the first image that I ever did um, <coughs> this project. And this kind of glowing hologram. And the reason I'm bringing up Garnier is um, buildings for the arts, it's not like when I do a corporate building. Corporate building, people are like, I need this much office space, I want this, this, this. When you're doing a building for the arts, you're working with the community. You're working with art patrons. You're working with potential donors. You're working with the university. It's, it's a project you do in a very holistic way. And so starting out meeting with groups, I was showing this image to say, what can you imagine? And what I heard over and over again was, I want a building that to be seen and to see people to mingle it. I want the Grand Lobby. I want those spaces that I can be part of the community, which was perfect because it worked with what the university wanted to do. They wanted a building that was extroverted. It's, classroom buildings are, are rather introverted spaces. They wanted a, a space where people could come to the community and see the campus but the campus could also see the people in the building. So an extroverted building, a building where everyone could come together. It also came from the fact that there's been a movement in the past 10 plus years that's been kind of changing the Grand Lobby concept. I'm sorry I couldn't find better images. Um, there's, many built, there's many theaters, performing arts centers being built with this idea. I turned to Minneapolis, it was an easy one for me, um, I know it well, is the Guthrie, which was originally designed in 1963 by Ralph Rafson, and the reason the images are so bad is he designed, I love this facade, it's this glass facade, and then it has these wood elements that remind me of like, you know, like mass balls where you hold the glasses up, you know, I mean it's this funny little facade that started decaying within a month. So it, it didn't last long, and the whole facade, and by the way, when I say facade, I'll also say curtain wall, and a curtain wall means an all glass plane, and like this one is supported with a space frame, but a curtain wall just basically means not windows fitting in, it means a big glass system. So it was rebuilt, but it's still the same concept as a big glass lobby. So from inside, you see the downtown, you look out from the outside, you see everybody inside. The new Guthrie, this has been torn down. The new Guthrie opened a few years ago by Jean Nouvel. It's on the Mississippi River, has a great site, but it's very much a building about a shape. And so you can see that, I mean, it has, great, it has a great view. It just turns inward. It's not about the view. To him, the building is about controlling your experience. And so think about it, as you go to museums, as you go to performing arts centers, the reality is the whole experience is not when you're sitting there watching the performance. The whole experience, and for better or worse, it often starts from you parking your car to getting into the hall. Your experience is, ex is expanded, and it's certainly expanded into that lobby experience of entering into a space. And so what he wants to do, and a lot of theaters being designed this way, is really control what you experience. And then the big wow is the hall. Um, and so for this, this is what the lobby space is like. So it's dark. I mean, it's, it's controlled. And so when I, was, when I did the presentations, people were saying, I want the Grand Lobby experience again, when, or early on. And this was a decade ago. When I started this project, it was over, I think, 10 years ago. We want the great community space. And that is something very important to my work. This is a small art center idea that had a tiny, tiny lot in a giant building next door. And the only way to really resolve it is I stole space. I took a zinc box of the galleries cantilevered at 30 feet over the river. And so it just hangs there, and the building is basically a sculpture. It's a copper tower and a floating zinc box. And what it's done with the Mayo Clinic in the city is it had a very tight budget. Um, and so it's become the community space. And what's great in a space like this 
is. It's, it's about view, it's about light, but also artists can use this because it's cheaper materials. They transform it. So you've got kids on the stairs, they do murals all the way up, and at a certain point, they just knock it all down, paint it, start over again. So it's, it, it, this lobby is this active space for artists, but it's also a great space for the community. They do concerts, community meetings, and, um, and art shows within the lobby space, which really takes advantage of the views of the river. That being said, this is a corporate headquarters I did. Lobby spaces are important in, in many different kinds of buildings. So this corporation went from a, a we often call them pancake buildings. Everybody was on its own floor. And so if you were in one department, you never saw or mingled with anybody from another department. So we proposed creating a grand lobby that gets everybody moving. First of all, it gets people on the stairs getting exercise, but it also gets them mingling with a common space and um, down on the first floor. They also, but this is, when you ask a client to do this, some people will say, well, a lobby is nothing space. It's expensive space. Why am I paying for that? So when a, when a client like this says, I want to do this, they're not getting necessarily what one would say is usable space. But I'm arguing it's the soul of the building. It is usable space. And in this particular case, they got so excited about it that they commissioned artists to do works on every floor. So now they have these areas where you can meditate and get away. Um, the stair does hang. Again, I love, you can see it, cantilevers, hanging things. You saw the grand stair, structure that makes you scary. I can't help it, I love it. So now talking about our building, you're now experts. You know this is, this is going to be tough, right? We got a performing arts center on a campus that has smaller buildings. So I've got a really big building. I've got a fly tower that's 90 feet tall. I need a loading dock. And this does not have a back. There is no back to this site, right? So we now have to design a building that's interesting from all sides. And it doesn't overtake the campus. We have one fly tower for the theater building, but it's, it's much smaller than the 90-foot fly tower we have. And uh, it's a fantastic site. It's the front of the campus. It's a wonderful site. But then how do you use it? Because people are coming from all different directions. So looking at a site plan, oops, I was just reminding you, Garnier, remember? <laughs> the building has to look good on all sides. So we've got parking on both sides of campus. So we have people coming from all directions. We have Nordoff as our main public street. We know people are going to come and drop off here. You're going to have buses and things dropping off here. So we really have people, and that's the red dots are saying, we've got people coming from all directions. We have, as non-sexy as a loading dock is, a loading dock is really important in a building like this. The loading dock can really only be on one street. It has to be here on Lindley. So it starts to orient the building. And to put the lobby on Nordoff facing south really turns its back on the campus. And so we started to think of how this building might work. And also, you can see there's courtyards throughout campus. And so that idea of maybe picking up gardens and courtyards started um, generating a lot of ideas. So the university didn't want to make life too easy. So in addition to it being a performing arts center, it has very different programmatic, programmatic uses. So this part of our building, our lobby and hall, you know what a performance space is. You know? So it's mostly evenings. It might be a matinee. It's that, that kind of in and out of the public. Then you have behind the stage the back of house. The back of house is a stage door. So a stage door lives a different life than that lobby space. So artists are coming all different times, technicians, people who work in the offices. So they're coming in a, at a very different way than the public is. Then going, all of my plants by the way north is up. So going north you can see like number nine. That whole area is the theater department space. And theater students 
from all I know, I'm going to look at the faculty, but they're as bad as architects, uh, architectural students. We, were, we go in weird hours. We're in and out of weird times. We're going to classes. So you've got a whole other security situation, a whole other door that you have to deal with. We're in a space that's used by the whole campus. So this space is used six days a week, Bob, 10 hours a day by the whole campus. And then above us is KCSN, a radio station, 24 hours, seven days a week. This is a difficult program. And so if we try to have one door, you can come in. <laughs> if we try to have one big door and lobby for everything, it would be extremely difficult. And it'd actually be a huge lobby. It would be very difficult to do. So we started to think of the building as being pieces that worked, as, as almost separate buildings. And by doing that, it allowed us to make the building tighter. One of the most sustainable things you can do is get rid of square footage. And it's also one of the co most cost effective things. So the more we can put circulation outside and part of the gardens, the tighter the building will be um, for costs and for as far as creating a green building. <laughs> I love the fact that this building has this program. I go, I go to campuses that have only this aspect and not even really much of a back of house. The buildings are dark a lot of the time, so they're not being used. This building is being used all the time. This is really exciting. <coughs> it just generates a difficult plan that you have to work out. So as I was, and I apologize, as I was working on this and putting the pieces together, I kept doing these arcs. Because here's Nordoff, and this is your public face, and you want to pull that public community into the campus, into that quad right up to Oviat Library, the heart of the campus. And I kept drawing these arcs, and one of my friends when I was putting this together said, you drew those arcs 22,000 times, Carrie, you've got to have some sketches. I couldn't find any, so I apologize, I didn't find any sketches. But that gesture of the arcs actually generated this whole front area. So we have an arc of glass, we have an arc of stone, every balcony has an arc, and they're all pulling from the city into the campus. This side of the building is more rectilinear. The buildings on campus are rectangles, they're square, and we wanted to recognize that context. So we really bring these curves together with that, that more campus-like plan. So, Here you see the building from the front, those first arcs. The other piece we did, since this program has very few outside spaces and has the scale issue, is we thought, you know, stairs are interesting. So as you walk around the building, there's stairs. The stairs are on the outside. So here we've got a stair that is, that actually is right there, that um, connects to KCSN, to the radio station. So I talked about with my work, you saw the art museum, you saw the, the corporate headquarters. There's a very strong connection inside, outside. And that's really important to my work. I, I just really am interested in that connection. I don't like a, an exterior and interior that, ha that are different animals, different pieces. So you can see here that those sunshades, up in that cantilever sunshade, they go up and down. They come into the lobby, they become our ceiling panels that go up and down. The stone wall on the south goes from outside, inside. I'm really interested in the connection because I feel that the garden area is as much a part of the lobby as the lobby itself is the architecture. And <coughs> so here you'll see, here's the big arm coming in. We've shaded the south glass with, uh, the south is, is easier to um, shade through a horizontal. And remember, we have our hall here. How do you make this really big space interesting? And so what we did is we created those arcs, became balconies on that south facade, so that there's a relief to it. It's not just a flat wall. And at night, it's, it's lit, it's wonderful. It breaks down the massing of that space. 
But as I told you, that 90-foot fly tower really dominated the campus. So everywhere around the building, the building steps down in scale. The one place I couldn't help myself, <coughs> you see the full 90 feet is on Nordoff. Nordoff has so much going on, the traffic, the signs, the electrical poles. It's the one place where the building tw twists in right here where the hall is, and you see the whole 90 feet. Because Nordoff could hold it, it could handle it. And I just, I love that tease of seeing that's how big that space is, where the, the stage is. The tile we used, and I'll talk about the interior too, is this little one inch quartz tile. It's a rubble tile, so as far as sustainability, it's like the leftover tile. It's very, very inexpensive. And what I love about it is it's almost like a, pix a pixelated photo. You know, you can blur your eyes. So even though it's this massive wall, there's this interest of these little pieces. <laughs> I talked about the ceiling plane coming in, the floor plane does also. The floor plane is a stone plinth, becomes a fountain, and then comes inside, becomes our floor surface, and actually wraps up the wall. So here we move inside, there's that stone floor. And I talked about the little pieces making the hole. That's carried through throughout the building. So the railings, uh, the stair railing, every tread has a glass piece. It's not big, massive pieces. The ceiling plane is a bunch of little tiles that are going up and down. I like to think of it as the staccato ceiling. And what it reminds me of is if you look at a sheet of music, there's all the individual notes, but you also read it as a whole. And that's the way the ceiling works. That's the way these individual pieces work, is they give scale, but they're part of a larger whole, of a, of a cleaner, Whole. You'll see as we move throughout the building, the material palette is very tight. I like to keep a really refined material palette. So you really think about very simple materials. So we have stone, we have glass, we have white metals, and then wood in the hall. The interesting thing about, well, and here's another case. You see every stair going up. Just again, a little cadence, a little music, right Colin? Yes. <laughs> the, I'm teasing it because this is a construction decision whether or not to articulate that. <laughs> so the ceiling is really interesting and it describes the process we went through. It is that we had a construction manager very early <coughs> on. We, and when we were designing this building, California economy was going crazy. And copper was selling, like, well, that's throughout the country. Copper's prices, because China was building so much, or going through the roof. So every month we were over budget, and we have to cut back and cut back. And so my initial scheme had this huge cantilever and a big flat stucco ceiling. And the construction manager, C.W. Driver, who actually became the general contractor, said that's going to be too expensive. The you can imagine a, a big, heavy, Plaster ceiling is heavy, and they, and they have a lot of man, man time, people up there building the ceiling, a lot of scaffolding time. So um, they said kind of do over. And so I asked the question, well, what if there are identical panels that could be built down on the ground plane and then all put up at the same time, the scaffolding time would be less and they'd be lighter. And not, of course, telling them that they didn't all line up. <laughs> but, um, but they said, yes, that'd be great. And as much as I joke about them not lining up, the panels are identical. They just have different leg lengths. And so we have two great people in our office, Rebecca and Becky, who work their hearts out laying out A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. But what this allowed us to do, it saved money, and it, <coughs> where are the light fixtures? Instead of, you think of a lobby, a grand lobby, they have very expensive light fixtures. I mean, we didn't have money. By doing this, our light fixture is the ceiling plane. We could use energy efficient, inexpensive light fixtures. You never see them. They're on the lower panels lighting up. This also hides our sprinklers, our, um, our um, any fire suppression systems, fireproofing. And the other thing is, a space like this is not, it's not effective to air condition this whole space. That doesn't make sense. 
you air condition where the people are and you pull the air out. Well, to do that, you need big areas with fans on top. Well, there's big open spaces up there. You never see them. They're hidden behind the panels. And they just pull the air through. So that hot air rises and it goes straight out. So it actually saved us a lot of money and was a great idea as far as all the different engineering disciplines. But it's also a fantastic architectural element. And so when I design, that's what I like. I, I like a building that, is, that has all of this depth that you solve many problems through one design aesthetic. And it was great, I don't know if you remember, Bob, when we came into the lobby and the woman came in and she said, that's a modern chandelier. And I thought, it is, it is a modern chandelier. Um, here's where I said the panels come in and actually the walls tilt out. So the panels come in and then the walls tilt out, the stone floors come in and they wrap up to our 34 inch base. Uh, one of my favorite details, very simple, is the stainless steel angle that the stone hits and the plaster. It's my drink ledge. <laughs> I've always wanted to do a drink ledge. I've, two, I've designed in two projects and never got built. It's a little area where people can put their cups down. It becomes a great way of bringing two materials together, but I don't know if anybody uses it, but that was the idea. We pick them up quickly. <laughs> Good. But I hate when everybody puts their cups on the steps or on the top of a garbage can, you know, and it just... Here's another stair tower, and it actually is a pivot piece on the, the rectilinear part of the building. And it has a lantern on top, the peak of the stair. Um, one thing that happens if you're in the lobby during the day is... The first floor, when I'm in the first floor, I feel the room is not that space where the glass stops. The room goes to the grass berms, it goes to the trees. The room is that whole space to the landscape. I go up to the loge, the room's now become the campus. I look out, I see the music building, I see the other buildings around. I go to the upper <coughs> level, the room is now the valley. On a clear day, you see mountains all the way around. And I love the fact that this space does that. It, it continues to connect you in different ways, moving through, um, moving up in elevation. And I mentioned the white metals. You see them consistently throughout. I'd like to move into the hall now. And I show a Boston Symphony here. Um, and it's Boston Symphony and the traditional concert hall is they're called shoebox halls. They're, they're like a shoebox. And as I said, it's a concert hall, so it's not like us because the stage is really part of the room. And you can see a very strong proscenium here. This gold frame, it's like a mirror or something, that separates the audience from the stage. Another hall traditional hall, very strong proscenium. Here you can see you have a fly tower, so it's a harder edge. But again, a separation of proscenium to stage. When we started working on this hall, we talked about the proscenium. We really talked about wanting the stage to be part of the roof. And so thinking about that and working on it, I really saw these rippling wood ribbons that go all the way in to the stage. You don't have a hard, hard edge. The wood has to stop because there's lighting positions, there are technical aspects, but the wood comes in and is part of the stage. When, it is in, when the orchestra enclosure is there, you can see the ceiling plane cascades down from the top the wood ribbons hide the, the catwalks, reflector, and then become the orchestra enclosure top. So even though we are a, a fly tower arrangement, you have a sense that the stage is part of the room. And as we've been talking about, the materials, again, other than the wood, white metals, aluminum, stainless steel, and then the wood, a very refined palette, only two types of materials. Like the perforated metal panels and the sun shades, we use a mesh. And what the hall does, and I don't know many halls, if any, that have the same diversity, is the challenge for this hall was very complex. It needed to go from, you have a full orchestra on stage, 
You want reverberation. You want live sound. You want warmth. To a movie premiere, you want it dry. You want nothing. And all the music, all the sound has to come from surround sound speakers. So at the same time, working with the university, us, all of us, did not want a room that's a completely different space for one performance and another. We wanted the room to look consistent and iconic no matter what the performance was. So we came up with the idea of all of these variable acoustics, they're all happening behind the stainless steel. So you never know, the room's being tuned. You have no idea that anything's happening because it's happening behind that mesh. And it's happening up above and you never see it. And I think that's one of the, the powerful things about the space is it never changes. I wanted to show this image because you're never going to see this. <laughs> um, there is so much more going on in one of these halls than the room you're sitting in. And you saw that in the section of the fly tower. There, there's a lot up there. And my saying that is I'm standing there, I'm standing here as the project designer and lead architect. But there's a, po there's a point on this project, there are 100 people working on this project. Architects, uh, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, acousticians, landscape architects, theater consultants. These projects are done by, not done by one person. They're done by a huge team. And as I said, the client is very involved and was very involved. They're part of the design team. So you're really, as, as a design architect, you're trying to keep a vision together, but you're hearing a lot of voices. And that's essential to doing a building like this, is you have to be able to incorporate all these ideas. And there's times it's frustrating because you feel like a parent because you have to say no a lot. <laughs> because everybody wants everything, of course. And you can't. You can't for the budget and you can't to keep a building not looking, you know, the cliche as a building that looks like a camel. Um, you can't, to keep a true vision, you have to say no. But there are so many people working on a project like this, incredibly talented people. Um, and, and this is a great team that worked with me. Uh, foul spot booth, you can see the giant ducts that are taking the air out up above. Line sets are, to me, are just so beautiful. I had to show a couple lines of pictures. All the dressing rooms and everything back of house. This is the large rehearsal room on the southeast corner. And we, we've won a, a number of architectural awards so far. We won one last week. And I have to tell you, Bob, the architect, the one of the jury members showed this image and he said, I want this to be my living room. And he said, he said, you know, I'd simplify the ceiling. I don't think I need a pipe grid. But he said, this would be a great, I want this to be my living room. This is a, a large personal space. It has a pipe grid that's 50 by 50, so it matches the stage. So somebody coming to perform can practice in a space that will replicate the this, this stage. So, um, but these spaces will be used for everything. They can eat, you know, they might eat them, they might use it for storage. You never know in a place like this who's showing up and what they have. Bob's just nodding. <laughs> because they're, and they can be secondary performance spaces for us. So the large rehearsal room is a great space. And by now you know inside-outside connections. Those slots are then on the outside, these windows. And working on the building and trying to give it some elegance, I kept getting drawn to, in the metal panel area, vertical slots. And actually, they even show up in the stone. Um, the slots broke up this heavy mass. And so here's our window. And then below it is a light fixture. And sometimes it's a niche. You can see all these silver lines here along the building. And it'll happen when there's no, there's no window or anything. They're just vertical lines. Those are snap covers. Snap covers are what are on the sides of windows. They're cheap. We had a budget problem. But the snap cover also becomes a wonderful element. It catches the light. So we started to use them to create these patterns and it's fantastic. It com completely breaks down um, the, the heaviness of that facade that has very few windows. And, um, 
And it, it really gives that long linear, and I think of it as columnar, it's like columns. This metal panel, perforated metal panel, is the same, same metal panel we had in the cantilever in the front. We've taken it from a horizontal situation and turned it, and it's now vertical. This is our loading dock with the hangar door. And so the loading dock disappears. And you can see that perforated metal panel is also our railings. So one material becomes many different things. The loading dock is tucked deep into the building. And um, when you're working on a building like this, you loading dock stage. But there's certain adjacencies that you can't change. And we're going to go into the theater department next. Loading dock number nine is the scene shop. Number 11 is the experimental theater. Those are sacred connections. You have to easily be able to go from a loading dock to a scene shop into a stage. And so as an architect, when you're working on a building like this, you know that there's going to be connections. They're just givens. And so that is part of your original diagramming of how you put it together. So I, I want to, for one moment, I just want to mention that I think the courtyard is one of the best rooms in the building. The courtyard is just a phenomenal space. And what I'm thrilled about is that it's actually used. Sometimes you create these spaces and you're nervous. Every time I come out here, performances, people are there. Students are practicing. They're doing different, um, there'll be three or four different groups for a class working in the courtyard. It's fantastic. That's what you want to see in a building. And the courtyard does a beautiful job of framing back toward the other arts building and completing that east-west campus. Here you can see, remember our slots on the east side? They come all the way around, and this is when they're lit. So they just break up this heavy facade and make it light and elegant. And actually, you know, like those mesh, the mesh with the, the stainless steel bars, they have that same feeling. And it almost has a, a drapery quality to me. It just has this elegance, this long linear elegance. The stairs, and then this is the bridge that connects the elevator lobby from the theater department over to KCSN. I see all these spaces as performance spaces. You have one person on one of those outside stairs and you've got a performance. I've seen students up here using the bridge. They were filming. They're, they're all Romeo and, Ju and Juliet balconies. And that's what the courtyard is. It's an outdoor theater. So whether it's a performance or whether it's just the students and audience using it. But it's a fabulous space to people watch. So moving over to the entrance to the experimental theater. There's also a small rehearsal room, and the small rehearsal room has a hangar door just like the one at the loading dock. This one's filled with glass, so the space can open up, and you can have a performance with people sitting in the courtyard. You can use it in many different ways. It's a great, again, inside-outside space. And here, entering into the experimental theater, that portal has these long, now our metal panel has cutouts again, long linear slots. So those kind of shapes repeat all the way around. I call this stair the peekaboo stair because um, we, because of the programming and because of, we just had so much sight. You know, you can't have everything on the first floor. As much as you want everything on the first floor, it doesn't work. So we have dressing rooms for the theater department on the second floor, and they're big because they're classrooms. So you will have people getting in costume and coming down to perform. And so the peekaboo stair has translucent and transparent planes of glass so that you don't perfectly see somebody in costume. It's a tease. You might see a little bit of them, but you can't perfectly see them as they move up and down the space. The experimental theater is a traditional black box. It means all the seating's movable, so you can be in the round. You can do a more traditional proscenium-like setting. The tension grid is a fantastic thing to have. It's very safe for students. So they're adjusting lights. They're getting used to working in a space like that. The tension grid on like a catwalk that has openings. It, it, it's a consistent surface. The scene shop and um, the dressing rooms. The, this is the large dressing room I'm talking about. So they're not just using it as a dressing room, they're not just doing makeup, they're also learning. So there's a projector in there, it's more like a classroom space. 
and the costume shop. Um, wrapping up, I, I wanted to mention the sustainability aspects. And uh, this is a project I did. It's in Minnesota, and it was in addition to an old conservatory. And the old conservatory was not in a north-south access. And we're doing a new building, so it had to really pick up. You had to respect the old building. But at the same time, you want to design a building that, is, is, that basically maximizes, it's a tropical exhibit, maximizes winter light and minimizes summer light. So you see these panes of glass, they're at an angle, and it's perfect for winter light, and it deflects more summer light. Um, just like, the, the, I, I love pools on, on buildings, I love incorporating pools. This particular pool came because that original building had Victorian water platters as part of the exhibit, and they're heated, and it wasn't efficient. So Victorian water platters are those giant Amazonian water lilies. And they wanted to bring the, the exhibit back, and it's Minnesota. So what we, did, <laughs> what we did is we took the excess heat from the building and exhausted it through the pools. So we heat the pools eight, nine months out of the year without using any, different, uh, any additional uh, energy. Now, you see along here, there's these little awning windows. And think about when you've been by a pool and the evaporation, air right above a pool is moist and cooler because of that evaporation. So what we do is we pull that air in so it's moist, it's cooler, and it goes into the tropics. So this actually helps air condition our tropic space through a very sustainable way. In the firm room, up, you can see up above, there's photovoltaic panels. They go back and forth like this. Ferns grow in dapple light, right? They grow under trees in dapple light. So we use photovoltaic panels to create the dappled light for the ferns to grow in. Those then power the greenhouse. The classrooms there, just like here, all the materials are sustainable. Sustainable wood, recycled wood. A uh, big part of sustainability is natural light. So the classrooms are filled with light. You can see that the skylights pick up that same idea of the photovoltaics. And then we have green roofs that the children go out and work on um, adjacent to the classrooms. Uh, Georgia uh, building that uh, I did where it was an old warehouse. It was going to be torn down. We needed to build artist studios. It's perfect as an artist studio. We cut slots through with windows. We put those Claire Story windows facing north. Architects like to call these things honkers. <laughs> so we had honkers for every studio. And I mean, this is 25 foot clear. This is, these are great artist studios. And you could never build them. They'd be too expensive. But by reusing a building, they have phenomenal spaces. And that um, also Georgia project, west-facing glass using verticals, and again, turning glass panels to deflect the light. And then in lobbies in Georgia, they were tearing down all these cotton warehouses, and they had gorgeous wood timbers, wood floors. And so we, we hired someone to scavenge wood, planed it out, and made wood walls in the lobby and in the theater. So for this building, um, I think uh, hopefully most of you've heard uh, it, it's it's great. We, we were gold certified by LEED. LEED is Leadership and Environmental Energy Leadership and Environmental and Energy Design. I do that every time. I am LEED certified, believe it or not. <laughs> um, but it's a way of studying um, how a building can be more efficient and then documenting it. So uh, a building like this is very hard to get um, sustainable and get certified because performing arts centers, you can imagine, you have to control humidity, you have to control the temperature, you can't have flexibility with those things. A big part of LEED is natural light. You can't have daylight in a lot of the spaces. So how do you create a sustainable building? And there are ways to do it. One is the landscape here. Well, first of all, I've already said, keep the building as tight, small as possible. Create as much green space as possible. The landscape itself is drought resistant. It's native plants. Pamela Burton's office did a gorgeous job in the landscape. It's wonderful. 
There's hills all the way around, have you noticed, along that edge? Those hills were made out of the fill taken. So when they dug the basement area, they then made them into hills. So they used the, that infill on site. South elevation. We layered the walls, they're heavy, there's not windows. <coughs> west elevation. Best way to do west elevation is actually in a vertical orientation than a horizontal. Our horizontal cantilever helps, our verticals help, that curve and the angle of the glass helps. We did many, many light studies. And in addition to keeping existing trees, especially these gorgeous oaks along here, which are fantastic, we've added over 150 trees to the site. So as these trees grow, they also help um, shade the west-facing glass. But just as important, remember I said, we have giant exhaust fans on top. We're not trying to air condition this whole space. That black line you see on that lower balcony, we're providing the air low. We're not, some lobbies will be dropping air from all the way down or trying to do the whole space. We have the air low and we pull the hot air that's rising anyway and we just exhaust it out. <coughs> this is our north facing glass in the courtyard. The most glass and the glass that has the least shading because we don't need it. I, I love talking about this because it just shows how smart we all are. <laughs> the hall uses displacement ventilation. Displacement ventilation means that you, the air is being treated directly below you. So this is a plenum. There's a big hollow area underneath all the seats. And you'll have little grills when you look underneath you in your seat. And the air is coming up and, uh, and being the perfect temperature right where you are. Then those huge ducts up on top are pulling the air out because heat rises. Displacement ventilation, all the halls are being done with displacement ventilation, 19th century, early 20th century. But you know, we're so smart, forced air is better. So all the halls start getting built with forced air. And I, a lot of you have probably been in a space where you're in, there's forced air, so it's really cold and drafty in one area, and it's really hot and sticky in another area. It doesn't work in a space like this. And so here we are, late 20th century, 21st century, going back to the technology, the displacement ventilation of the 21st century. It's a much more comfortable space, and it's also a much more efficient way of heating, of actually cooling. Halls, even in Minnesota, you don't really worry about heating a hall. When you have 1,700 bodies, it's all about cooling. And so that's what, that's a very efficient way of, of treating a space. I mentioned our light, fi light fixtures. Look through, look around, even here. You don't see many light fixtures. Our light fixtures are, always, are almost always hidden so that we could use energy efficient light fixtures that were also less expensive. And so they become elements like in the niche and things. Um, but it saved us an incredible amount of energy. And then back the house, the lights are on motion detectors. So you're not wasting electricity. So I'm right on time. <laughs> I want to finish with, um, I started this whole conversation with Cyclical, the cyclical world of the arts. And we looked at Times Square, and we have a phenomenal survivor in our own building here. This beautiful sculpture in the front of the building is a George Rickey, Rickey sculpture. It was commissioned in the 1960s and for campus. It sat in a pool of water in the arts area of campus, and the earthquake destroyed the pool, damaged the sculpture. The sculpture really didn't have a home anymore. It ended up broken and in the trees to the west of Oviat. And about halfway through the project, somebody said, you want a Ricky? I was like, what? And they said, we've got this sculpture, and do you think it would work? And so we all walked 
walked over and we said, this is phenomenal, yes. And grants were found to restore it. It was moved into a, a pool of water again. It is gorgeous and with its new base and I would have sworn it was designed for the building. I don't know if any of you have noticed it. It, it is so perfectly complementary to the building. It's just, it, it's very moving to me. And it has a new home. It, it, it completes the building for me. And it's, it's, it's one of those, you know, how arts, you know, an art sculpture that doesn't really disappear. It, it had another life. And so um, I'm thrilled with it. I just, I think it's fantastic. So um, that's the end of my talk. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I went to school here in the 90s during the earthquake. And I just remember <clears throat> sitting in trailers. And uh, to see this and actually come alive at this school is really phenomenal. I'm actually jealous. <laughs> <laughs> um, th so that's kind of where I'm at. Is like, a, what kind of structural integrity is actually in the facility now? So if there's an another earthquake that it's not prevented to fall down like the other buildings did. That's a fantastic question, actually. It's a, it's a really fantastic question because think about performance hall. You have to have complete acoustic separation from the outside. So massive walls, massive, often floating roof planes, so that nothing can come inside, right? We normally do these in concrete, massive concrete walls. And how do you do it here? Earthquake, uh, most of the buildings that I, I do in earthquake zones are steel because you have a choice in earthquake zone. You either make it so rigid, it's gonna to hold together as a piece, or you let it move. So what happened with this building, the most efficient way to design is to let it have flexibility and move. And, and the joints are, are, are fixed joints. It's not like it's gonna break apart, but it allows a sway. You know, we've all been in buildings that sway a little bit. You don't try to make it rigid. But to have an acoustic separation, you can't have a building that has that kind of flexibility. So there's actually incredible control joints around this building. So the hall itself is a heavy, solid mass. It doesn't move. But then all the buildings around it move. So there's big control joints um, in the building. But it was a major part, you know, from... Um, Okay, cantilevers. You've seen, I love cantilevers, so this huge cantilever in the front, which actually was bigger, we pulled it back for um, cost uh, reasons. Um, a structural engineer at work with calls them Kara levers. <laughs> but a cantilever actually um, is, is sticks straight out, and the best way to do a cantilever is one third projects and two thirds go back into a structure. So, you know, it looks like it's massive. So that beam is going all the way back and then connecting all the way to the hall, and that's what's anchoring it. So that actually is part of the rigid system, whereas the rest of the metal building is part of the flexible system. And that's actually kind of why I like the change in materials, because it really kind of talks about how they work structurally. So, yes? In the courtyard, you have uh, rectangular lights Right. Uh, they're LED lights, um, very energy efficient, extremely energy efficient. And if you think about, you know, we've got up and down and up and down here. We've got the glass panels of the railings that move. Those lights in the floor just create just the soft little pattern in, in the ground plane. And I, I think it just enriches the experience. There's a lot of actually ground plane to ceiling. If you pay attention, um, the fountain and stone mimic the cantilever up above. So by sometimes putting things in the ground plane, it starts to create a relationship above that, that is different, that just kind of changes reality. And so, so that's why we use them. Um, they're actually really energy efficient and, and inexpensive to use. Anybody else? Yes? Um, I'm going away from the first project we did to where we started with Times Square. Um, you said that when Disney came in, that kind of anchored attention to that area and helped start the Renaissance happening. 
doing there, was there, and uh, you were talking about community action, was there um, a specific goal as far as the community action went to seek out people that you could bring in to try to create an anchor and create an interest to pull other people in, or did Disney approach? Disney was later, but I have to say, I was working on this mid-80s. Um, I then went and got my doctorate from in a joint program between MIT and Harvard, and actually was teaching and not practicing. So it, when, when all this really happened, I was more in the academic world. But from what I know is the catalyst was, well, actually what stopped everything was lawsuits. So Disney didn't really get involved until, I, this is 84, 85, and these community activists were involved. Disney, I don't think, fully purchased the hall until like 93. So it was, it was really the community groups Landmark Preservation Alliance, there were a number of groups that just said, this is the great white way, you can't do this. Um, and, and, to, and started to take the corporations to court. So, um, but I, I don't really know, I wasn't really part of it during that whole time to know the sequence. My, my background in my undergrad is arts and leading a mass MBA urban planning. So I, and I love architecture, so I've been trying to figure out some, you know, the whole, the issue between private and public and community partnerships and how to get things. So I'm looking at all of that and just trying to figure out how they are. Just, uh, all I'll say is, I was involved in Times Square. I've never read about it since. I've never seen articles. Does anybody, did anybody else know that they're about, they're going to raise all the theaters? I never, I mean, I, 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 there's got to be a dissertation out there somewhere, but I think it's interesting how these things happen and community groups transform such a huge part of Manhattan, but it's really kind of a quiet story. So, but I'm sorry, Bob, did you? Well, we didn't rehearse this, but I moved to New York City in 1991. <laughs> <laughs> we really didn't rehearse this. We did it. The first project in the Times Square redevelopment plan was funded by the New York Times Foundation to rehab the Victory Theater, which is now called the New Victory Theater, that marquee where you saw the Dirty Five, <laughs> all right, is now the New Victory Theater, and it was committed from the get-go to bring families and youngsters into Times Square to see the live performing artists. And it's a really interesting theater because it, the history of the victory goes back into the generation before the victory, and it was the Oscar Hammerstein Senior Theater, okay, which was where opera was performed on 42nd Street. Okay, so there's this, sorry, no, this no, it went great. too much about this, but um, it, was, it, was, it was a very, there is a dissertation or about 10, because each one of those theaters ultimately has a corporate sponsor, whether it was Disney, whether it was Ford, whether, you know, the hotels came in, they built on top of the space, so the place was, was transformed through a tremendous partnership, you probably know Times Square because it's the New York Times. The New York Times building is right there on 43rd Street on the west side of, of Broadway. And so they were very, very quietly. Joseph Lullybelt was the editor of the New York Times at the time this project took place, and his wife was the chairman of the board of the redevelopment of the New Victory Theater. So it was, it was something that very big dollars in New York invested in quietly on the road to bringing 42nd Street back as, a, as an attraction for the world. As you, as you said, it's this amazing destination now. Sorry. I no, just... that's fine. The one thing I did want to add, though, that I forgot was, um, you know, I talk about those little lobby spaces, but when I was doing research, one of the fascinating things is many of these Broadway theaters had roof gardens. And so the whole roof of these spaces would be a cafe, would be beer gardens, they would have, you know, they would have this, these crazy themes. 
And what I think is so funny, um, I mean, I'd love to have seen it then, but what's so funny is now, every city I go in, everybody tells me, you've got to go to the new roof, go, you know, the new roof bar here, and the new, you know, it's the thing. But to think of Times Square in the 1900s and <coughs> teens being just this world up on top of the theaters, I think is just fantastic. I, you only see sketches and things, you know, you don't see much of it. And you couldn't bring them back now because they never make code or those kind of things. But, well, they wouldn't. I mean, they wouldn't. No, but, but, um, but, but to just think of that, it, were, it was like that. It must have been an amazing place to be. So. Any other questions, sir? Can you give us a, a little picture of the development of the program? Who you worked with and, and how much input you had? Sure. Um, starting over a decade ago, <laughs> the first thing you do is a feasibility study on a project like this. So um, there are companies that do architecture firms. My firm didn't do a feasibility study. There was an outside firm, and I actually don't remember their names. I've used so many different ones. I don't know if you remember Colin. Well, you get, but you guys did the major part of the... No, I'm saying the feasibility the feasibility study, we did the programming, but you, there's a marketing firm, oh, yeah, and they yeah, started yeah. interviewing people in the valley. Would you come to a space? They start talking to different groups, and part of this, what's really important in this, and it's one of the most difficult things with the hall, is the size. Acoustically, a 1,200-seat hall, perfect. Paying the bills, the 1,200 seat hall, not as good. So it's always a give and take. And actually, Broadway shows want 2,400 seats. So what this original studies started talking to the community and understanding what the whole might be for theater performances in the Valley. Then we, we've done a lot of these. So once you know the size of the hall, you're already you already start to know the size of the space. Then you working with, we have a theater consultant, and so they're gonna say, okay, a hall this size, is gonna need this many dressing rooms, you start to do that. Um, we worked with the faculty of theater, and we sat down and we said, okay, what is going to complement? You've got other spaces. What is working, what is not working, and what can we bring for you, to you? So like a, the, the experimental theater, black box theater, is, yeah. <laughs> It, it, they had nothing technical like that. Um, so that was the perfect space to be put in here. And um, KCSN came as part of the program. And it was always, the radio station was always supposed to be part of the building. And then to help pay for the building, to make the building really usable, the lecture hall. This is probably the most usable space that you have at campus or lecture hall. So to actually have a nice sized lecture hall, 230, 200 plus, became part of the program. So you interview a lot of different people, whether it's faculty, whether it's um, administration, and then for the hall, working with community groups, and they did a lot of surveys. You know, what kind of uh, experience would you come here? And, and so actually it transformed a bit. It was bigger. It, um, Back of house had more scene shops and things, and it, it just didn't seem, as the study went on, feasible to do that. So um, it functions a little bit more. Do you know the term roadhouse? So most shows come in and go out, but we have two nice big scene shops, repair shops. Those are back of house, but it's really not designed to do a lot of uh, performances yourself. So. <coughs> One piece that I haven't mentioned is the mechanical spaces are gigantic here, by the way. <laughs> you can imagine. So that's part of your program is for a space like this, you have very large mechanical spaces. Well, how did you become the architect? Did the university approach you because they see your former work? Did you hear about this project? What typically happens is the feasibility study, they sent out, there, there was a proposal that's sent out, we're looking for architects who specialize in, specialize in performing arts centers. Um, I have my own firm now, at the time I was with HGA, and that's the nice thing about, about being in Minnesota, it's easy to go to both coasts. And so um, they interviewed, I don't remember, probably five, like you probably got 50, 75 firms applying, Interview five, uh, we were chosen for the feasibility study. 
we did that feasibility study, so we created the program, we kind of had an idea what the building was, a cost estimate was done, and then the project went on hold. Um, it's a hard, hard part of my world. Is doing buildings for the arts is a dream job, but a lot of them go on hold. You'll design a whole building that sits on the shelf and never gets built. It's part of what you do when you do a project like this. The building went on hold as they looked into funding. When it came back, the university decided that they had such a great relationship working with us that they hired us. We, we did a proposal and they talked to a couple other people, but we never had to re-interview because they felt we had already created such a great dynamic through the feasibility study, which was the early architecture, basically. And that's a pattern that's followed uh, many, many times. The firm that gets the feasibility study, if, if they're really, really successful in the charrette process with, with the folk who are on the campus making the decision, creating the program, it's really, really unusual for there, there to be a break at the end of the feasibility study if that relationship is really a rich one, unless the project just goes dormant for a long period of time, and then leadership might choose to totally start the project all over again, because new leadership might not have any ownership in the previous process. And there are shelves uh, in universities all over the country filled with such projects. <laughs> I will also say it also gives the client a window out. We do a lot of projects where they they decided they didn't working with the feasibility during the feasibility study. They didn't have a good feel. They didn't have a good connection with the original architect. So that's a nice way of making sure this is going to be a team that works all the way through. So, I'm sorry, sir, you had a, yes? Oh, uh, yes, the uh, color choice of the, uh, the lighter woods in the main hall yes. uh, it, it appears to make the room uh, look so much larger perhaps than it even is. Was that the original uh, color choice? Yes, um, the wood in the hall is, is Anna Gray. It's a, it's a tropical wood, but they, um, they harvest it sustainably. And I really, really, really didn't want a blonde hall, and I didn't want a cherry hall. So I was looking for a golden, I, I, okay, we didn't have gold gilding, we didn't do a gold gilded frame, but there's something about a gold wood that just is luminous. So it, 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 the, the light reflects back during performance, the, the light comes back, it just, it just, it radiates that that golden wood radiates light during a performance, and so it, it was a very conscious decision to do that wood. And I, I think I've never used it before. I think it's fantastic. I really love it. I thought of the question that was asked about about the earthquake and 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 the ability for this for this uh, parts of this building to be rigid, parts of this building to to float. Um, and I rem I remember showing photographs to people in other parts of the country about that showed the density of the steel in the part of the building that's not meant to float and it's really really stunning how much steel both vertical horizontal and diagonal steel is hidden within those walls that have been faced with gypsum board and with the mosaic it's 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 a remarkably dense um, um, amount of steel and and Colin and, and some of his team, you know, used to laugh at me when I would look at just where the, where the steel came down into the concrete and, and the amount, of, the amount of, of rebar that's in the concrete in this building is kind of, um, I, I, you know, I grew up in the Midwest, we only have tornadoes. You know? and, and, and so, you know, the, the idea here of this incredible density in that part of the building that's supposed to remain rigid should another horrible earthquake happen here versus the other part that, that's much, much more elastic. I was here on campus, excuse me, during the 80s before the big And I remember the old bit library and uh, the trimmers and the walls, the cracks in the walls. You know, any little thing you know, the walls were just like if you look at the stone, big stone walls, um, remember white metals again, you're going to see long, thin silver lines. And those are all aluminum, they're just aluminum trim pieces. 
they, they're covering control joints everywhere. There's so many control joints in this building. Um, and I mean, massive control joints. There's one in the back that's massive. And it's just, it's for that movement so that things don't break, that things don't crack. The building's designed to allow that movement now. And I personally hate control joints. There, there. But in this building, <laughs> It was a given, and we actually then incorporated it to the design by, by using these. And I like the silver lines, actually. They pick up light again, just like we had the horizontal lines. So, Ma'am? We came here to hear the Minnesota Orchestra, and we were just amazed at how the sound reverberated through that hall. And I'm sure I would like to talk a little bit about the acoustics. I can find that. Um, we, have, we had an acoustician. I, I can't. I mean, I had to work with the acoustician. They do a lot of 3D modeling, and they, they study how, this, how the sound will move through the space. But there is a reason those walls are rippling on each side. Because when you create flat surfaces, you can get an echo, of, you can get that effect that goes back and forth. And so, when I, the, actually, Boston Symphony, the top, when, the, when you look at the, the three A-plus acoustic halls in the world, it's good old Boston Symphony, you know, from the turn of the century, Amsterdam, and, um, and Vienna. And part of Boston is a lot of stucco work that goes in and out. It's not big flat surfaces. And so it's that idea with those wood ribbons that break that up. It's the back of the hall then that has the stainless steel panels and they have variable acoustics. It's like heavy, heavy velour basically that is pulled up and down through um, wires and so for the orchestra they were down for anything with amplification you're going to bring it up partially or all the way and then up above between all those catwalks are giant draperies again they, they can go up and be sealed into a box so for the orchestra it is loud and so hall like this, and it, it cost money, but we made the commitment to do a great acoustic hall. There's actually a huge chamber up above. When I showed you the pictures of the, sound, of the catwalks up there, so the hall comes up, and then it has a big space, which is all about reverberation. It just gives even more volume to the room. So it, it's, it expands the room. And then amplified sound, Velour curtains drop and it deadens all of that so you don't have the sound vibrate back and forth. So um, the biggest thing with acoustics is, is volume and, 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 that, and it's hard because volume is expensive. The bigger a building gets, the more expensive it is. But that is, that's, that's one of the reasons that room works so well is we did put the money into having a very large volume for that kind of performance. Also, what happens with the heating and cooling, she explained the registers in the floor. That actually opens up that area underneath the room to, to increase the resonance. Mm -hmm. So there, there are literally hundreds of those cylinders, and that adds to the volume of the room because those are like huge catacomb finished rooms underneath the floor of the orchestra and parterre. So that's another place for the sound to go. The other thing, if you're having any problem visualizing the velour, think of Hunter Douglas blinds on steroids. <laughs> okay? And this isn't an ad for Hunter Douglas, but it's, if, if you know that kind of that kind of honeycomb, the horizontal honeycomb, these are just giant honeycombs. And so when we tune the hall, about every six to eight feet, there's a different motor that operates that particular piece of the tunable acoustic. So you can move through the hall with that tuner and raise those or lower those to adjust all the way around the entire room, all the way up to the, to the very top, to the catwalks that, that Carol was explaining. And actually bringing up the displacement ventilation, it's also the quietest system. A lot of halls, you'll hear just this background whistle, you'll hear something, you know. Even the vents, when they open and close, they're little clicks. 
Displacement ventilation is silent. So it, it's an extremely quiet space. But during construction, it was amazing. I'd be up in the, the upper balcony, and their workmen would be down on the stage talking, and you could hear every word. And of course, they don't know. That you could hear every word. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a good room for secrets. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being with us this evening. Come back and see us for a